Right. So it's got this kind of acceptable level of sexism here at the bottom that people are not supposed to call out. Um, you're not supposed to say anything. You're kind of supposed to be like, ah, oh, that's just if Brian. You're just being one Brian. of the boys. You're just a yeah, boys right? the boys. Yeah. If you engage in locker room talk, it doesn't necessarily mean you're a rapist, but no. it creates a culture in which rapists can hide. Hello, and welcome to the Politics Girl podcast. I'm your host, Lee McGowan. Let's get into it. Today's podcast is a candid conversation with Mark Green, co-founder of Think Play Partners, senior editor for The Good Men Project, founder of Remaking Manhood, and author of the groundbreaking The Little Me Too book for men. Mark is a writer, speaker, and coach who deals with the challenges men face being raised in what he calls the man box culture. Mark has spent over a decade writing and speaking on masculinity, and he claims two questions remain at the center of his work. Why do so many men simply accept the deep loneliness that informs their lives? And what is the link between men's disconnection with others and their ongoing abuse and violence against women and members of traditionally minority and marginalized communities? Mark's work focuses on deconstructing the binary way we talk about manhood and masculinity, and he works with individuals and organizations to create a healthier, more connected vision of masculine culture. I'm having Mark on the show because as I see it, we're at a tipping point of either a resurgence or the end of the patriarchy as we know it. We're living through a major upheaval in how our society is structured, and that's getting a lot of pushback from men who clearly feel they're losing something and they're lashing out, either individually or collectively. I want to get Mark's take on where he thinks this behavior comes from and what we can do to make life safer and happier for all of us, men included. So without further ado, please welcome my guest, author, writer, and coach, Mark Green. Welcome, Mark. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me, Lee. Well, thank you for joining me today. The subject of men and how they interact with the world is something I really want to dive into because I see it as such a huge issue in today's society. I had David Rothkop on a while back, and we were talking about the importance of asking the big questions, right? Yes, we have to deal with the current events, but we also have to look at the big picture and how society is functioning and the changes we have to make if we want to actually progress. Now, personally, I feel really strongly, and I think you and research agrees with me, that the patriarchy is holding us back, not just women, but men. Um, and society as a whole, that this idea that men, particularly straight white men, sit at the top of some sort of human hierarchy is damaging mm. and unproductive. And as society challenges that notion by elevating other ideas to positions of power and amplifying their voices, many men are finding that their identity is being challenged and not all men are reacting well to that challenge. Absolutely. Yeah, that's that sums it up nicely. So now you talk about the concept of the man box, this rigid structure that men have been taught to fit in for forever. And this concept is based on kind of a generations old dominance based culture of masculinity and how it yes. operates. Right. So it was first mm -hmm. framed as the act like a man box. Can you walk us through this concept? Sure. Well, in the early 1980s, there was a man named Paul Kivel. He is still active in this work. You can find him at paulkivel.com. He, in the early 1980s, was working with the, uh, um, the Oakland Men's Project, and they were trying to understand why there was so much uh, violence against women in their community. He began doing some work in the schools, and ultimately that led to him asking boys in the high schools in the Bay Area, what are the rules for being a man? And what surprised him was the rules that came back were consistent and repeated and relatively simple. And some of the rules he heard were things like, don't show your emotions, be a breadwinner, not a caregiver, um, be tough, don't ask for help. If you have conversations, um, you know, keep them surface level, make them about money or sex or girls or whatever. Um, and there were a couple of other rules that came back, which are much more uh, dominant and, and harmful. One of the rules was uh, be heterosexual, not homosexual. Mm -hmm. Another one was uh, always have power over women and girls. Uh, and these are the kinds of ideas that uh, that he saw crop up so consistently that he began to think of it as sort of a box that boys and men were pressured to stay within. 
so in the process of, uh, of creating this conceptualization, he named it the act like a man box. And the idea is when boys didn't perform masculinity in these ways, that they would be bullied and policed by the other boys or men around them to get back into the box, so to speak. Um, I will say that uh, a, a man named Tony Porter, who heads up an organization called A Call to Men, did a really, really world famous TED talk. And he reduced the language of uh, the act like a man box down to simply the man box. But his TED talk is really great if you if somebody wants to go check that out. So this man box basically refers to a set of beliefs that's communicated by society, our parents, our families, the media, our peers um, that put pressure on men to behave in a certain way. And yeah, that and the, pressure and the tell- distinction I would make that's well, the one distinction I would make that's important is that the man box isn't about a set of rules. It's about the enforcement of them. Right. Because traditional okay. masculinity is probably an okay fit for some men. But the idea that we all have to perform it that way, and if not, we'll be bullied and subject to violence, is uh, is where the man box idea comes in. Right. And it also sort of sets us up with this sort of hierarchical pecking order, right? So you either perform mm-hmm. within these narrow set of ideals of what a real man is, or you are subjugated in some way, you know, which is sort of where we get this idea of how much money do you make? How many girls do you get? How much dominance do you have over society? It sets up a society where we go to parties and the first thing people ask us is, what do we do? Right. And then they base the mm-hmm. what do we do on how much money that makes and they set up a hierarchy. And that's all part of Part and parcel of the same thing, right? Yes, most certainly. And the the dominance-based culture of masculinity can only take place in a culture in which the other aspects of being human or being men have no value or devalued. And those are the aspects of being men that are, are that make us individuals, that make us distinctive, that the, the authentic aspects of ourselves. All of those things have to be utterly devalued if we are going to create a structure where how much money you make and how many girls you get is the way that you are judged in terms of your masculinity. And over time, sort of like based in the 80s, back in the day, when uh, men are straight, not gay, was part of the deal. Um, I would say that's the one thing that might have adjusted a little bit in the past 40 years. I think people can see that I think a lot more people are open to the idea that you can be a man and be gay at this point. But a lot of the other things remain the same. Well, what's interesting is when you talk about dominance-based masculinity, that is the enforcement of the man box, um, the most e- extreme version of that is, of course, in, in authoritarian uh, government and, and laws. And the, the Texas GOP platform uh, had language added to it, which said that being gay is an abnormal choice. So you can see that they're bringing that back in. We, we thought we had slayed that dragon. But I assure you that the Republican Party is going to weaponize anti-gay uh, thinking and attitudes uh, because that for them is, again, returning to those original ideas of how to force people to conform. Absolutely. It was shocking to see them write it down like that. It's uh, unbelievable. Mm-hmm. And they also wouldn't let the log cabin Republicans be part of their uh, convention this year, which are gay Republicans mm-hmm. in Texas. It's quite striking how... Uh, clearly the Republican Party is telling us that they want to return us to some sort of straight, white, uh, probably Christian male patriarchy. And, uh, you know, the reversal of Roe is only going to be one part of that, right? Yeah. The stuff that's coming behind it is is significant. And people need to note that. They really need to be paying attention. I think a lot of people think, oh, it's not going to happen. You know, like, this is how we live. And no, they really, really want to roll back the clock. And I think we need to keep our eyes open on that. If I may, um, I think what's really important for listeners to understand is that this man box culture is not simply a set of rules for um, for how we're supposed to do being a man. It, it What's important to understand is that what it creates for boys beginning in infancy and coming forward, uh, requ- it, as I said earlier, you have to, you have to uh, disengage and invalidate more human aspects of what it means to be a boy or a man in order for a dominance-based hierarchy with white males at the top to be enforced and to be put in place. The, the thing that we have to do with young boys and is that we have to break their connection in the world. And man box culture is designed to do that. So if you have a, um, 
a three or four year old boy on the playground and he scrapes his knee and starts to cry, you can immediately see people in the park orient toward him. You may see his father go over or his mother go over and say, hey, it's OK, OK, shake it off. You're all right. You know, that's OK. Man up. You're OK. And in that moment, what we're saying is it makes us all collectively uncomfortable to see a young boy crying. And that is the most extreme expression of emotion for a young boy. But there are a whole raft of other emotions which are also suppressed in the process of saying, well, if you're a boy, you don't want to show too much joy in your friendships. You don't want to be too giddy or excitable. You don't want to be too playful. You want to start to take on this more stoic uh, performance of masculinity. And a woman named Judy Chu uh, wrote a book called When Boys Become Boys. And she did two years of research with a pre-K class. And what she discovered in the process of being in that class, which was boys and girls from pre-K through, through kindergarten, is that boys begin to hide their uh, emotional acuity. That is their ability to read and track emotional cues in others. They take on this more stoic performance of masculinity. And one of the stories she tells in her book is that a little boy at age four came over to her and said, Miss um, Chu, uh, I'm friends with all the girls in the class, but don't tell you know Mike, the head of the boys club, because if he finds out, he'll kick me out of the club and I won't have a club anymore. And the important part to understand about that is not only is this little boy not gonna be allowed to be in relationship with the girls in his class, but that's the moment at which boys are cut off from learning uh, the relational capacities to connect with people who are different, to grow their emotional expression, to, to manage complexity, all the things that boys need to learn to do to get to a place where they are maturing emotionally. So we cut them off. We just break connection for them beginning at a very early age. Um, and this story carries forward with a book by Niobe Way called Deep Secrets. And she's a professor at NYU and she did a study with boys in early adolescence. And she asked them, what does your best friend mean to you? And these boys in early adolescence would say, one, they'd say, I love my best friend. They'd use the word love unashamedly. And the other thing they said over and over again is, uh, without my best friend, I would go crazy. So four years later, late adolescent, she interviews the boys again. And they say things like, oh yeah, uh, my best friend, Mike, he lives around the corner, but I don't see him that much anymore. Uh, he's a good basketball player. No homo. They'll throw that in to make sure that everyone knows that if they compliment uh, another boy, they're not it's nothing to do with being gay. And then uh, another boy said, uh, yeah, those friendships, they're kind of on a crossfade. That, that one's kind of fading out. And what Way discovered was at this point in late adolescence, these boys are no longer concerned about what's authentic for them, what's meaningful for them. What they're concerned about is proving what they are not. And the exact language that they're proving they are not is little kids, girly, or gay. And it is in late adolescence when they finally let go of these friendships that boys' suicide rates become four times that of girls their age. Yeah. And teenage boys are four times more likely to commit suicide. It's true. And if you break mm -hmm. people off from their relationships, I mean, women, we're allowed to have mm -hmm. relationships. We're supposed to be relational. My therapist always says women... Uh, you know, people perceive the feminine as being relational and the masculine as being transactional, you know? So it's like, what do you right. do? Not who are you, right? And women are allowed to have these interactions and are, are, it's probably why we live longer. You know, we have these friendships and they base our relationships. And often with men, the opposite happens. You know, they get less and less friends. They become more and more isolated. And our culture is teaching men to suppress their emotional expression and their empathy and their caregiving and their connections. Um, all these things that allow us to have healthy, authentic, personal relationships, right? Mm -hmm. And then once you're isolated, then boys are left with kind of little choice but to embrace the one thing they have left, which is kind of this bro, man culture, masculinity that right. they're offered, but it keeps them alone, which is why so many older men are also so lonely, right? It's your friendships are through your spouse or um, their friends, that kind of thing. Yeah. And often when a wife dies, they say, oh, when my mother died, um, the doctor was like, just so you know, your dad will probably die soon. And I was like, what a horrible thing to say to me. Like, I'm going to be an orphan yeah. as my mom's dying. But he was like, no, statistically, you know, the husbands often go right after the wives because they don't have anything left to, they've got no emotional connection left. Now, I'm mm -hmm. lucky my dad makes a lot of friends, which is great. But that's rare, especially for older men. It is. And we know from uh, reams of research 
that loneliness is epidemic in the United States of America. The, uh, Cigna did a study in 2018, and they found out that one of every two Americans feels sometimes they're always alone. And if you want to, if you, you connect that to the process by which masculine culture breaks boys' connection, then you have these boys who are finally just give up all their close friendships going into late adolescence. And then what do we do? We shove them toward one girl and say, that girl's job is now to fulfill all of your emotional needs. Boys begin to conflate that deep sense of isolation and disconnection with sex. So they begin to make demands for sex over and over again, because it's the only space in which they can feel at least for a moment that they're not isolated. But the long and short of it is when you have a culture where loneliness is epidemic, if you have what's called chronic loneliness, you're, the health impact is equivalent to smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. You have higher rates of heart disease, de, neurodegenerative diseases, cancer, uh, depression, uh, diabetes, everything. It all gets much worse, which is probably directly why men die earlier than women, because men yeah. face much higher numbers of social isolation. It's yeah, killing us. Well, in, it, you yeah. know, man box culture is cutting us off and then killing us. Yeah, absolutely. And you you point out also that for for centuries, women, indigenous people, people of color, members of the LGBTQIA plus community have been marginalized or subjugated, which in some mm -hmm. ways made fitting into the man box relatively rewarding for men, right? But over right. time, these underrepresented or marginalized populations have fought for an increasingly successful battle for equality, right? They've they've said, hey, we want yes. our voices heard. Hey, we want to be here in society. And we're far less willing to deal with that inequality anymore. And if we're not dealing with the inequality, then that do dominant man box culture is, is on a struggle, right? So we're moving to a place where everyone sort of gets to say, this is who I am. This is my authentic self, except men, traditional straight white men usually who are still stuck in that box um and that starts to cause some real problems am i on the right track with that you absolutely are and understand that that uh society in the 1950s which basically oppressed everyone except white males which is just so we can say where the republicans want to take us back to that sort yeah, of we're straight going back white to that that's what they want yeah it, it created a container of sorts that that man box culture could operate in and that the the rewards of that were were somewhat present there but when you collapse that container take it away that and that means cease to um assume that everyone here is to serve the needs of 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 white men, then what happens is men start to get less of the sense of privilege and and right to choose and right to define everything, and uh, and then they run into a, a a real challenge, which is um, when you don't operate from a place of human connection, from empathy, from community, from all of these things. And remember, the big joke uh, among Republicans years ago. The way that they, the cut down they had for Obama is that he was once a community organizer. So this idea that we are a collective, that we that our lives are all interconnected, that we're in a web or a network of relationships runs counter to the hyper individualism, which is one of the messages that we've been getting from the Republican Party for years, is that, you know, bootstrap culture, the Marlboro man, you're you're on your own, you know, stand if you don't do it on your own, then then you didn't really do it. All these ideas are designed to keep men in silos, keep them isolated. So we have a generation now of white men who are essentially living in gated communities, watching big screen TVs, which are pumping a lot of hate language at them from Fox News and elsewhere. And because of this sense of immense isolation, they have ongoing anxiety all the time. When you live in man box culture, you're constantly being policed by the boys and men around you. Boys begin to police each other's expression beginning very early. And this process by which a boy may giggle, he may get excited, he may be too want to hug, he may do these things that that are prohibited in man box culture. The first thing the little boys around him say, what are you, a fag? What are you, gay? Pardon me for use of the F word. And in that moment, that little microaggression makes him shut down that kind of need for connection. But what we need to be tracking is that it, these microaggressions happen not daily or weekly. They happen hourly for young boys and boys into adolescence and for adult men. This same kind of language is being used in the bar when some guy says something nice about his wife and the men around him go, man, you're so whipped, right? This language policing men to be dominant about women 
is a microaggression. What do you a sissy? What do you a girl that goes on tens of thousands of times? So as we teach boys not to connect, not to express, not to bring their whole selves, their authentic selves, we're teaching them that women are less. And this is a drumbeat brainwashing process. You wonder why men don't understand that their uh, privilege exists? It's because they've been trained all their lives that that it's the only right way to be. And if you stand up for feminism or if you stand up for women or if you say something nice about your wife or you say, hey, man, don't make that joke, then you're a beta or you're some mm-hmm. white knight or you're performatively being cuck. a nice guy so you can get, yeah, cuck, so you can get more sex. You're like, yeah. oh, this is just some performance. But it's not. It's just, I always find these men that I are, it's like the next evolution of man, you know, that is like mm. not in that um not in that bro box and people do feel uncomfortable with it because this this idea of how men are supposed to be is propagated not just by men but by women and by society in general you know like you i I, when i my son was little i had to actively stop myself from saying man up we used to always say hero up and uh and now we say woman up sometimes (laughs) um just to give them a different sense of who's strong you know and you're talking about this sort of performative masculinity that men are sort of forced to do, especially around other men who are policing their behavior. And I was thinking about an episode my husband and I just watched of Queer Eye um, from the most recent season. And there's a Texas rancher who seems almost visibly trapped in a man box, right? Like he's a rancher, he works with cows, he works with men all day, and he's truly miserably unhappy. He clearly screwed up a relationship with a girl that he loved by trying to get other women, which is one of the things you say that we're supposed to do that gives us notches in our belt and makes Mm -hmm. us more of a man. And he's talking about what he eats. And he says, I have a steak every day. And they're like, dude, that's bad for your health. And he's like, well, I sometimes have chicken, but I make sure the other guys don't see me eat it. And I was like, and my husband and I looked at each other like, he's secretly hiding eating chicken? Like, Who's policing this man's chicken, right? Like his brain. And they said, well, what about vegetables? And he says, oh, my mom raised a good Texas man. I never had to eat a vegetable. And we thought, oh, Lord, like this person has been raised that vegetables are sissy girl food. And, you know, self-care is something that only feminized men do. And at the end, he was so grateful that they had sort of unlocked what he was in. And he was giving these hugs, these bear hugs to these guys because I don't, it was like watching someone who was starved for real human connection when you'd been performatively pretending to be someone the whole time. And I was struck by it. I was born and raised in Texas. And Uh. I just want to reiterate something. I know men in Texas who are, are ranchers. They are... Uh, regular guys. They are somewhat suppressed in terms of their expression. But these men would never, never presume to tell another man how to do masculinity. So when we talk about the man box, we talk talk about men who are weaponizing this idea of a traditional man and then enforcing it on men around them. And what's fascinating to consider is that if, if this hierarchy this dominance-based hierarchy is so great for white men at the top. Why are the white men at the top, especially older ones, uh, why do they make up 75% of male suicides? So we're talking about a system that that men, it creates immense anxiety for men. Y- you look at the former guy. That is not a happy man. He is, an, he is a textbook case of domination-based masculinity. Whenever anyone disagrees with him, he would double down on dominance every single time. But that is not a happy human being. That is a human being who is driven by anxiety. And the anxiety in man box culture is created by the degree to which we have to leave behind authentic aspects of ourselves. So let's go back to the 1950s that the Republicans want us to have. Um, When we talk about a gay man in the 1950s, most of those men had to hide their sexuality. Now, when you talk about hiding that large of an authentic piece of who you are, what happens is you begin to track the men around you to make sure they don't notice that you have this significant part of yourself you're hiding. And to the degree that you're constantly aware and concerned about it, that creates a baseline level of anxiety. 
Now, for other men, it can be something as simple as the fact that they that they love their wife or that they uh, that they have like comic books. And that would be embarrassing for the other guys to find out or that they don't give a shit about football or whatever it might be that they're performing or hiding little things, big things. But we're all hiding something. Every single man in the world is hiding something because the construct of man box culture is so narrow that it couldn't possibly constitute a full human being, right? So we're all hiding something. And the process by which we get policed all the time by the men around us, eventually the anxiety rises to such a level that we vent it out sideways as an act of aggression at another man, an act of violence against somebody lower, supposedly lower on this hierarchy at a woman, people of color, whoever that might be. And in man box culture, we're encouraged to do that. So this is the weaponizing of isolated male anxiety for political purposes, right? So when we talk about the fear-based driven messaging of the GOP, of Fox News, it's all designed to weaponize this anxiety and to give men an opportunity to do what they consider to be justified violence. And also please note that men in man box culture are being fed a message of victimhood all the time. And this is baseline messaging for white supremacy and male supremacy. And that is that our race is being erased. We are being erased. And the idea that that men who con who control all of the power and, and in America still to this day, men control most of the power in the U.S. Congress. They are most of the police officers. They are most of the military. They have most of the power are complaining that they're being erased is the deep-seated messaging that drives incels, men's rights activists, white supremacists, all of them. It is the weird hypocrisy that, that I have a right to do violence because I'm a victim. Yeah, and that's exactly what I wanted to talk to you about because most men have been trained to find their identity by conforming to the patriarchy, which is the overall system in which they are forced to behave, right? Mm -hmm. And now that society is pushing back against the patriarchy, they feel like it's a personal attack against them, right? They can't separate themselves from the system in which they have been raised, right? So they see right. this growing equity of other groups as a loss of personal status, for which creates anger or alarm or depression or fear, right? And like something is being taken away from them, as you said, right? So I think there's a researcher, is his name Michael Kimmel, who it calls it aggrieved mm -hmm. entitlement, right? So exactly. what? Yeah, so aggrieved story. entitlement is where things get dangerous, right? And you were just talking about uh, incels and these kind of men's groups, but it even starts lower, right? There's there's something called the rape culture pyramid. Can you walk me through that and then take us all the way up to the dangerous, violent groups? Sure. Well, um, there's an organization called Eleventh uh, Principle. They uh, created what's called the, the rape pyramid, and you can Google it. Um, they talk about this idea that, that we, we have a culture of masculinity that is designed to have power over women and girls. So that manifests in uh, sort of baseline behaviors, which are supposedly just boys being boys. And that includes things like, uh, you know, locker room talk and, and cat calling <laughs> on the locker street room and, talk. and jokes, uh, jokes about women and so on. And you talked about earlier this, the degree to which men don't want to be called out by their peers for being, you know, outside the man box for not doing it right. Well, at the baseline, at the bottom there, it's just a joke here. It's a laugh there, a comment about someone's wife. And we as men have been trained for years to not step in and say, what is that about? What are you doing that for? Because we know and understand that the, that, patriarchy and dominance based masculinity is holding the line at that lowest level. If you if you push back there, then you're you're basically um, already a target for all the men in your circle. What is above those levels is you get to things like uh, sneak photographs and other weird behaviors that are sort of in the middle, uh, which are more violent and aggressive toward women. And as you move on up, you get to rape culture. But when Donald Trump says, uh, I talked about grabbing women. Uh, it's just locker room talk. What he's doing is he's using the sort of vast multitude of men who, even if they're uncomfortable with it, remain silent around things like locker room talk. He's using them as a cushion between himself, who is arguably a rapist, and yeah. uh, and all of the layers of the pyramid, which which 
which go back down to these supposedly harmless behaviors. This is another way that that extremists insulate themselves. Uh, they often use the language of, oh, I was just joking, or it's not a big deal, or what are you overreacting for, and all of that. Yeah. They have a yeah. massive cushion of narrative, of language that keeps their most violent and egregious opinions cushioned or buffeted from public discourse. Right. So it's got this kind of acceptable level of sexism here at the bottom that people are not supposed to call out. Um, you're not supposed to say anything. You're kind of supposed to be like, oh, that's just if Brian you're just being one Brian. of the boys. You just a yeah, boys right? boys. Yeah. But then that supports what comes above if you picture it as a pyramid, right? So it's that sort of underlying quietness where you accept a rape joke or a sexist attitude or the degrading of the feminine or the other that it allows them to build so that people can get even more violent, right? This passive compliance by most men gives us this kind of silent group that lays the foundations for the rape culture, this sort of like epidemic of violence against women and the other that we live in in America. If you engage in locker room talk, it doesn't necessarily mean you're a rapist, but no. it creates a culture in which rapists can hide. So it's, it, 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 and the thing to understand, if it's not coming clear in the narrative thus far, Man box culture has a single primary goal, and that is silence men, to silence men, to get them to shut up and not speak up and not speak their truth and not connect in authentic ways. It's all about silencing men and the resulting trauma from that. I mean, I, you know, if you think about young boys playing together, a couple of four-year-old boys, the joy and connection and improvisation and caretaking and laughter and everything about that is such a joyous thing to watch. You have to think how much trauma and violence does it take to get boys by the end of adolescence to give that up, to give up human connection. We don't fully comprehend the level of, of trauma that is required to do that. But every young man growing up in America has had to make hard choices about that. And we have solutions for this problem. We have ways that parents can engage. We have ways that men uh, in, their, in their adult years can choose to undo that work and break out of the man box. And these are all wholly human endeavors to get us back into connection in the world and create community and end those horrible isolation numbers that we experience. So whenever I talk to men about, hey, why don't you make a change? What I offer them is the end of loneliness, right? Because that's really the solution to, to ending man box culture, to ending GOP violence culture. Most people in that culture, imagine this, this men who hide their... Uh, their status as being gay to such a degree in such a violent context that they they suppress it so much that they end up becoming Republicans who attack gay people. This yeah. is the degree to which the psychosis can take hold of men who live in fear of making a mistake in masculine culture, in violent masculine culture, and in white supremacist circles and male supremacist circles. Uh, the degree to which you could end up dead is pretty much immediate. So we understand, we understand the degree to which boys and men lose touch with who they are completely. Some things get hidden so far away that they exist only as a ball of grief or stress in our guts because for so long we have existed in a culture which suppresses who we are. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, the amount of men who are secretly gay, who are the worst homophobes and the people that attack Roy Cohen taking out, you know, thousands of oh, people yeah. in the government yes. Um, yes. for potentially being gay when he was a gay man himself, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't and I want to be very clear. Roy Cohen represents the threat. He represents right. what's happening here because there are people in the Republican Party who are so far down the rabbit hole on their conditioning and their anxiety level is jacked up so high that the only thing they can do now is, is double down on what any authoritarian in that hierarchy proposes. So that's why we're seeing an acceleration of authoritarian ideas in the Republican Party. Suddenly, if, if DeSantis says he's going to uh, outlaw abortion, then Abbott's got to double down on him and arrest abortion doctors. I mean, this thing is going gonna, is gonna to very quickly accelerate into full-on um, authoritarian ideas, because now any man who doesn't double down on the idea that came before it is going to lose status in that hierarchy. And they're all terrified of that. And they're all jockeying for position to take Trump's place. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> it's very upsetting. Well, 
That seems like a good place to take a break and thank the people who made this conversation possible. And we'll be right back after this with Mark Green. So I've come to stay with my dad in Toronto. I had to drop my son off at camp, so I'm staying up here till he's done and I'm gonna spend some time with my family and write my book. But I'm feeling a bit smug as I'm watching my dad do his daily routine because every single morning he pulls out his athletic greens powder, puts one scoop in water, shakes it up and drinks it. I got him hooked. He's no longer taking a million pills. He doesn't need a million different supplements. He's drinking the green drink and he says he's never felt better. My dad's almost 80 years old. He was taking an arsenal of supplements and now he's getting all his vitamins and minerals and superfoods and probiotics and adaptogens that his body needs in one infused glass of water. Athletic Greens serves his gut, his nervous system, his immune system, energy, recovery, focus, aging. He has more energy than guys 10 years younger than him. I'm thrilled and he's impressed. I'm telling you, I don't just do these ads. I tell you about things I think are truly worth it. Honestly, I'm an only child with a mother who's passed. If I'm gonna give it to my own father, you can trust you can try it for yourself or get some for the loved ones you wanna keep healthy. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is giving you one free year of immune supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash politicsgirl. That's athleticgreens.com slash politics girl to take ownership over your health and give you or someone you love the ultimate in daily nutrition. Politics Girl has a new sponsor, Splendid Spoon. Splendid Spoon is a plant-based meal delivery program. And when they came to me as a possible sponsor, I was like, uh, you probably don't want me because I'm not a vegetarian. And they were like, no, we're not just for vegetarians. We're for anyone that wants to eat healthier and with less effort. And when I looked, it was amazing. Splendid Spoon has so many different options, including options for smoothies and juices and pad thai and pasta. And I thought, okay, maybe I'll give it a try. And then I realized it was a meal delivery program where you didn't have to do the cooking. You just drink the smoothie or eat the meal. It's already made. And I thought, oh, hell yeah, that is right up my alley. The problem with some of these meal delivery systems is you have to spend an hour and a half chopping up all the stuff. And I don't have an hour and a half to spend on my meal. I'm too busy. So the idea of a meal delivery program that I just get to eat and I'm eating healthy really appeals to me. Plus Splendid Spoon has so many different program options to choose from. They have breakfast, they have breakfast and lunch, they have breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And you can totally customize your plan to choose how often you want it. Every week, once a month, whatever works for you. I would love to eat a healthier diet, but I'm not gonna figure out an entirely new way to cook. With Splendid Spoon, I don't have to. Splendid Spoon focuses on ready-made meals, partnered with chefs and nutritionists to make sure every meal has the right mix of protein, complex carbs, and healthy fats. They take your favorite meals and give them a plant-based spin, while also introducing new sauces and spices and seasonings. It's gluten-free, no artificial sugars, no GMOs, and they use whole unprocessed ingredients. I would never cook like this for myself, but if they're gonna do it for me and my family can eat healthier without me having to think about it, sign me up. As I try the dishes, I'll let you know which ones I like the best, but how cool is this idea? Why don't you try it with me? Stay well-fueled this summer with Splendid Spoon. Get started today and save on an entire week of ready-made plant-based meals. Just go to splendidspoon.com slash politicsgirl for $50 off your first box when you subscribe. That's $50 off at splendidspoon.com slash politicsgirl. Let's do this. Let me back you up to the concept of, because we're familiar with the concept of white supremacy, but let's just back up a little bit to the concept of male supremacy. You know, this idea that misrepresents women as genetically inferior, you know, manipulative and stupid and basically reduces us to our reproductive or sexual functions, which is what they're doing to us now with these uh, bills. And that sex is something we owe men and, and probably something that should even be coerced out of us if we're not giving it to men. It's this biological analysis of women as being fundamentally inferior, which allows them to treat us in a certain way. And if they don't get what they want in a certain way, it often turns violent. You see all these, you know, the the boy who went and shot up the sorority house or the incel in Toronto mm. that drove into a bunch of people. This kind of, you call them, I think you call them masculinity extremists. Is that correct? That's correct. So there's a great article by the Southern Poverty Law Center just titled Male Supremacy. If you Google it, you can find it. But one of the things that they note very clearly is that white supremacy and male supremacy, those two populations, uh, overlap dramatically and that they recruit from each other's populations and that their primary um, their primary messaging is either condemnation of feminism and attacks on women or the victimhood of men. That is, men are being 
uh, wronged, uh, either legally or socially, or uh, their race is being erased, whatever it is. Um, when you weaponize the victimhood of men, what you're doing is you're tapping into the deep anxiety of men's isolation. So if we're going to solve the problem that we're facing, we have to intercede with boys at a very early age and begin to engage in them in ways that, that aren't terribly complicated. We just have to host space for them to share what's really going on for them, to be in conversation with them, to invite them to tell us what they see going on in their world. And the process of doing that is actually uh, really deeply enriching and inviting for parents. It's very, very meaningful for both parties. And if we can maintain an, uh, not a conversation where we're teaching and telling them all the time, but instead we're asking them what's going on for them in a way that they're in a back and forth conversation, co-creating the understanding of what it means to be a boy, co-creating the understanding of what parenting is, co-creating what the understanding of what a family is, then they will grow in their expression of their authentic selves to the point where they'll reach a tipping point and they won't buy into the gender binary anymore. And what you're talking about before is the gender binary. It's the idea that men and women are biologically X and Y, that they're socially X and Y, and that there is no actual spectrum between the two. Now, we believe that masculinity is best spoken as a plural, masculinities, that there are millions of different ways to be a man, as many ways as there are men to perform them. And that equally, that, that being a woman is a vast spectrum of ways of performing. And one of the things that's important to understand is that when we enforce the gender binary, men are men, women are women, um, what we're saying also is that certain relational capacities, empathy, caregiving, connection across difference, that those are feminine. And that toughness and leadership and handling pain and all that is masculine. But I would profess that all of those things are simply human. And if you want to see toughness and ability to lead and play through pain and all that, just look at the women's national soccer team, right? And if you want to see men being gentle and caring and forming connection and raising children, just look at the millions of stay-at-home dads in America. So the gender binary is a bullshit idea. The biological difference between men and women exists, but it does not define who we are or how we express supposed relational capacities, leadership, toughness, caregiving. And when we break down this idea that boys need to be tough and stoic and break down this idea that girls are communicators and, and polite and begin to let all boys and girls and non-binary kids express what comes naturally to them on a full spectrum, including ideas that may be traditional, I can't come to you and say, we need a full range of expression, but I don't like those, those ways of expressing. So traditional masculinity is part of that spectrum. I respect the men out there who are a little emotionally stoic. I respect, I grew up with these men, you know, but the idea that we would ever enforce what's right on other men and uh, other men and women, that that's when you get into the man box. So we create a container for our sons to talk about what's going on for them and our daughters. And these conversations are where fully realized, authentic self is born for our children. Which then would lead us to be more open and authentic people, which would allow us to have more connections, which would then make us less likely to lash out at people when we're older, right. either lash out at people violently, lash out at people um, verbally, or even lash out at ourselves, which goes back to your suicide rate. Right. My partner, Dr. Sally Habab, and I wrote a book called The Relational Book for Parenting, and it's literally full of stories, ideas, cartoons. What, here, allow me just to wave it at you. <laughs> this book. For everyone I mean, who's just listening to this, he's showing his book. And ideas and, and everything, right? Oh, this book has ways that you can, you can begin to engage with your kids at, starting as early as age four. Uh, about uh, about creating an ability in them to consider context, to express emotionally, to um, to listen with curiosity, all of these ideas that are all considered to be relational, that is that they center relationships over roles and tasks and status. And when we give our kids the opportunity to come fully into connection with us conversationally, we we solve the problem of the man box before it ever takes hold. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to do in my own family. But what do I do with grown men who have not learned these skills? And I think about listening to the mm -hmm. Senate talk to, um, you know, talk recently, mm -hmm. and they kept asking 
do you know what a woman is? Define a woman. What is a woman? And they couldn't take the answers that were like, well, that's, you know, I'm not a biologist and, you know, a woman is. And they were like, why can't these people answer this question? And I think it's because what you're saying about masculine and feminine, it's on a a spectrum. You know, there is, there are people that behave in this way and there's people Mm -hmm. that behave in this way and we're all kind of on a continuum, which is the way I've always thought about sexuality too. We're all on a continuum. There is no Mm -hmm. This group or that group, we're all on a spectrum. But there's definitely an entire political party that is trying very hard to stick us back into our traditional gender roles, back into our boxes, back into... And and to me, it feels like it's control, right? This way to control us again, that this concept of Absolutely. trans people is making them so bananas because it really does not fit in to their idea of how the world works. And how do we function with that? How do we address that with these grown people? I know we can we can start with our children and and put them into relational ideas so they are not unhappy grown people. But what if they're already grown? Right. Well, first and foremost, we vote because right. we have to protect ourselves <laughs> from them. Um, having said that, I, I think it's important to understand that some, well, okay, so most men will at some point as they age, reach a crisis point. And all of the rules of the man box, how many girls did you get? How much money did you make? How fast is your car? Did you win the sports game? All that stuff. They'll begin to fail at some of those things. We all will. Just from we age, just age, yeah. Just You'll just age, you'll age out of being able to do the man box. Your pickup lines don't work at the bar anymore. Maybe you don't get that additional raise at work. Maybe you get sick. Maybe you get ill. Maybe you have an injury. You blow a knee out. Whatever it is, At some point, men are no longer able to compete. And what man box culture says is, well, that's it for you, buddy, and kicks you to the curb and all the younger men roar by. Now, some men who reach that crisis point, maybe their second divorce, it may be that their kids won't talk to them. Some men have a moment of enlightenment and they say, I got to do something different. This isn't working. Some men weaponize that frustration and anger and they say, America's a mess. Uh, the Democrats are a mess. My kids are a mess. And they and they double down on dominance like the former guy always did. And those are the men who are obsessively watching Fox News and deciding who to hate next, right? But a certain amount of men may say, okay, this is it. This is my moment of truth. I need a different way of, of being. And those men uh, may join organizations like the Mankind Project. I, I went to the Mankind Project and did their weekend and uh, and I have to tell you, I'm 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 like, you know, the the guy who would never be a member of any organization that would have me. I mean, I was very, <laughs> sus, you know, I just sus- I, I thought, is this a cult? What are these guys doing? I don't know. It's a weird weekend thing. I don't know. Eventually, I, I had to go because I've been writing about masculinity for 10 years. And my friend Boyce and Hodgson, who is involved in the organization, kept inviting me. You want to go, Mark? And I was like, no way, man, I'm not going to that. And I finally went. And what I discovered was a room full of men who ultimately are tired of policing each other and just want to talk about what's going on for them. And the process over the course of the weekend allowed us to engage that. And as part of that weekend, in my moment on the carpet, which is when each man has a chance to talk about his story and what and, and what's challenging for him, what came out of me, it, well, 40 men were looking at me, was uh, based on my childhood, based on my life, I don't like men. I don't trust men. I hate men. And I'm sick to death of being alone. And in that moment, they, they looked at, I'm I'm, I'm freaking weeping and shit. I'm just like breaking down. Right. Because this is my life. I'm I'm a 55 year old man and I'm alone. So they say, well, you know, you want to, you want to try trusting us? And I said, fuck, why not? I mean, at this point, and turns out I could. And it turns out that, that when you have a circle of men who really You know, we talk about safe spaces. You want to know what a safe space is for a man? It's anyone else being curious about what's really going on for him, really caring. Like, I want to know. I want to know what's going on for you, brother. What is happening in your life? In that moment, it's very difficult to get men into a men's circle, whether it's at the church, wherever it is, you know, where people are trying to do this work. But once a man sits down in that circle, we talk. We tell our stories. We tell stories of loss and grief and despair. The idea that I went and did my weekend, I broke loose a lot of stuff in my gut, in my body, in my mind, in my heart. I found relationships that really matter to me. But you know what I had to deal with next? 50 years of grief that I hadn't done this work when I was 20, that I hadn't found my way to this place earlier. 
all the years of performing the man box over and over again, two divorces, um, estranged relationships with every boy and man I ever knew. Why don't these guys like me? Hmm. Well, I'm going to go back to performing this weird caricature of a human being and still won't know why nobody likes me. Isolation, loss, grief, men have to deal with that once they come to the work and do some of it. So it, it, we're talking about if we can get the kids young and get them to understand what authentic connection is in their own bodies and in their own ways of speaking, how to say what really is real for them, we save them decades of loss and grief that older men have to deal with even when we come to the work. And we save society from those men who are isolated and angry and don't know where to put their feelings from attacking us. That's correct. We are under, we are under threat. We have to draw a bright line. We have to draw a bright line between those men who can make the change and those men who are going to continue to assault everyone else's rights as human beings. Yeah. And what do we do if one whole political party is trying to go the old way? Take us truly back in time. I, you know, I, when I when I tell people online that if you don't vote Democratic in your federal, state, and local elections, every time an election comes up till the day you die, uh, then then we can kiss our, you know, republic goodbye, our democracy goodbye. I hear a lot of people say, yeah, but the Democrats haven't done this and they haven't done that, and I feel like there's a huge disconnect between. And mostly when people say, I don't hear that, I don't hear that from, from black Democrats, honestly. I, I tell people all the time, I just take my guidance from uh, female black leaders in the Democratic Party. Whatever they say, yes, I should that's be doing, I'm doing it. Because yeah. I absolutely trust their political instincts. What I do see sometimes is I see white kids, um, uh, you know, uh, supposedly, okay, let's just set trolls aside for a minute. I see some white leaders on the left saying we should have gotten more out of the Democratic Party. And I'm like, that's not the game anymore. The game is whether we ever vote again. The game is whether our kids get rounded up and put in fucking b gulags, you know? This is not a joke right now. What's coming yeah, next camps. Is, is Putin's Russia. What, yeah. That's what's coming here because he's yeah. funded all of this. And, and I don't mean to be like, oh, Mr. But we, we know now that the NRA channeled millions of dollars of Russian oligarch money into Russia, into Republican campaigns. We had U.S. senators going on July the 4th to hang out with Putin in Russia. I mean, if we're not seeing the pattern by now, we're never going to see it. Yeah. And if we're being so told, you know, just vote and and we can fix the Democrats once we have uh, our democracy under control once we're not living under, like you said, Putin's Russia. I mean, Putin recently just told his people that there is no war in Ukraine, that it's just not existing anymore mm. on RT. And I think, you know, if we only had Fox News here, if that was the only station that we could listen to, that's what people would think here, too. Just like, you know, it's not the Russians fault that they're only listening to Putin's propaganda. Um and we all know that should we give DeSantis and Abbott and Trump and these people control again, they're never giving it back. And they've told us the kind of world they want. And that's a world with women who are mm -hmm. subjugated, where we do, do not learn about black history, where we do not learn about gay people, where we don't even say gay, where they don't exist. Like you said, the new Republican mantra is it's an abnormal way of being. They wrote it down. So I think we have to be yep. very uh, clear eyed about what is actually happening here, that the problem this kind of concept of what's going on with traditional masculinity and how it hurts our society is only part and parcel of what's going on in society. But if we give Republicans the power to be in control again, we will all be forced back into those rigid roles that make people so deeply unhappy. Aside from voting and working at the state level, which I really believe everyone needs to do, and I double down on it every week to tell people to do it, there's a lot of organizations that do the kind of work you're doing, right? The what ones would you recommend to tell people if they want to look into changing their mindset or being happier people or not being so rigid and conformed? Where would you tell people to look or read? Well, there's men's work, which is a specific thing where men get together and try to understand what's going on for us and how we can reconnect with the world. The Mankind Project is one organization that does that. Um, there are organizations which are uh, working to create equity in the world. A Call to Men, Tony Porter's organization, is an example of that. 
I am a continue to be a senior editor, and I have been for uh, 13 years at the Good Men Project, which is a resource for that. Um, I have written a number of books. I've got a, a lot of articles on Medium where I try to uh, deconstruct what's going on in terms of men and masculinity, both in terms of the radicalized versions, but also in terms of what kind of solutions we can create uh, to get connection to happen in authentic ways for us. And anywhere you look on social media, if you look for Remaking Manhood, you'll find me. So that's on Twitter and Instagram and Medium and wherever. Um, if, you, if you're looking for a solution, you can begin with a book. You can begin with a podcast. We have a podcast called Remaking Manhood, the Healthy Masculinity Podcast. You can find a therapist and preferably a, a therapist who has a, an understanding of how to work with men. Um, often that can be a male therapist. Um, but women are very, very good at this work as well. But find one who understands men's issues. Um, either any way you want to come into this conversation, uh, there are uh, a number of folks who I do. I, I co-host the podcast with a man named Charles Mathis. Uh, Boyson Hodgson is with the, uh, the Mankind Project. Uh, Michael Kasdan is doing something called Lawyering, Lawyering While Human. And he does a lot of work in terms of uh, trying to make the legal industry less abusively competitive for men and women. So the long and short of it is it, it doesn't take much to if you maybe just Google healthy masculinity and look for some of the resources there. But we're waiting. Men are waiting to, to bring other men in and do the work with them because we're still doing ours. It's work that never finishes. Right. And it's about creating community, sharing our stories and uh, and being in relationship with each other. Right, because this pressure to be manly enough and to do manhood right is just alienating men and making them feel like failures or making them violent. And you believe that men have a whole to cancer and heart right, disease and, and making them sick. Suicide. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, we can't have people constantly feeling like they're failing to perform and then lashing out at others because they can't. I really want to thank you for joining us today because I, I feel like this work is so essential. I'm raising a 14-year-old boy right now myself. I'm watching him go through it. I'm trying really hard to uh, give him the tools to go into the world, to be a part of the world and not separate from it. I'm, I married a very good man um, and he's had trouble himself. He's in his 40s, right? And the amount of men he's called out where he says, hey man, like don't make that joke. And the pushback he gets from saying that kind of thing is bananas, mm -hmm. you know? Or he'll say like, don't talk to me like that. Don't call me a bitch, you know? And his friends will be like, oh, why do you have to be so... And every man knows this feeling. But we need mm -hmm. the men out there. We need the men to get rid of that cushion for the bad behavior, for the locker room talk, for the rape culture. We need to switch society up so that this Republican vision of the world will be less tolerated by everybody. And I so appreciate you taking the time to talk to me today because I know it's a wildly difficult topic, but it's one that clearly needs to be addressed. And I, I thank you so much for devoting your career to this idea of an evolved and less dangerous version of man. Thank you. Everything I've talked about today is in the little Me Too book for men. And oh, as you can see, it's very such cool. a good it's book. Like a tiny little book. Back here. <laughs> see, it's, right it's right there. Love um, it. It's literally 75 pages long. Most chapters are two pages. It lays out this entire map of what's going on for men. And it can be very helpful uh, for women, men, non binary people who are trying to understand what's going on with boys and men. Um, I will say also, please come and listen to our podcast, uh, Remaking Manhood podcast. We have had Judy Chu on there. We've had a lot of very well-known uh, thinkers, uh, Graham uh, Golden, a lot of other folks. Uh, and if you want to start doing the work, just listening to that podcast will give you a way in. So men, come join us. We're waiting for you. We're waiting for, to do this work with you. And women are waiting for men to do the work too. Yay! Yay, progressed men. Woohoo. You're not cucks. We love you. Woohoo. <laughs> yep. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much. Lee, it's been a huge pleasure and and congratulations on all the reach and impact you're having. So thank oh, you. Oh, we gotta make the country better. We gotta save it for these these kids. We will. So that was Mark Green, author, host, and coach of Remaking Manhood reminding us that man box culture is the air that generations of boys and men breathe, grew, and exist in. This world of domination-based bullying and trauma, which strips away their ability to truly connect with the world, and that disconnection is splintering our society. 
True and honest relationships are every human being's birthright. But this loss of connection for men leads to social dysfunction, sexual violence, loneliness, grief, mental illness, and early mortality. We've given men so little room to be authentic and have meaningful connections that many of them are deeply unhappy and that unhappiness spills out of them in destructive ways. I can think of so many men that would benefit from this work, and I know that society would be a far better place if we would all be more open to a different, more inclusive version of manhood. Mark also reminds us that one entire political party is doubling down on keeping men in the box with white male supremacy on top, and it is only our work and our votes that will stop us from tumbling down that slippery slope to authoritarianism, which is the logical conclusion of dominance-based masculinity, and we can't allow that to happen. I'd like to thank Mark for being with us today and you for caring enough about democracy to be here. Now go out and make the world a better place. Until next week, PG out. The Politics Girl podcast is written and performed by me, Lee McGowan, in partnership with the Midas Media Network and produced and edited by Happy Warrior Entertainment. All rights reserved.